This week's Parsha, Parshat Korach, jumping right into it, Reb Leib is sharing with us the very first verse, as well as Rashi's interpretation, and he's going to teach us a very, very special lesson about parents and how parents have to act specifically in front of our children. So take a look at your screen. I'm going to share with you. All right. First Torah, first verse in this week's Torah portion, Numbers chapter sixteen, verse one. Vaikach Korach ben Yitzhar ben Kehat ben Levi. So Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of the the son of of Kehat, the son of Levi, took himself to one side, along with Vidatan Vaviram ben Eliav, with Vidatan Aviram, the children of Eliav, Ve'on ben Pelat ben Reuben, and on the son of Pelet, all the, the, the descendants of Reuven. So this is a very interesting to, uh, verse. There's so much to be spoken about, specifically with this verse. What Rebbe draws our attention to is what Rashi tells us, that we're not telling us Korach, the son of Yitzhar, alone. We're saying Korach, his, the son of his father, then his grandfather, and then all the way back to his great-grandfather, Levi, which actually was... Jacob, Yaakov Avinu's son. So Rashi is 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 wondering. Well, I guess before we get into Rashi, just right out this tells us thing: Was there another Korach that we had to know who exactly who he was? Maybe there was. Uh, maybe Yitzhar had more than one Korach, or Kehat had more than one Korach grandson. Why was it specific that each and every one had to be mentioned? Yeah, that, that's that's not Rashi. What Rashi is addressing. Rashi is addressing something else. Rashi is saying, hmm. If we're already going back and mentioning his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, why don't we also mention his great-great-grandfather, which was Jacob? The verse should read, Vaikach Korach ben Yitzhar, ben Kehat, ben Levi, ben Yaakov, Avinu. Why does it stop at Levi? This is Rashi's question. And Rashi tells us a very, very interesting answer. That... Jacob himself prayed before he passed away. He prayed that his name would not be mentioned with regards to this dispute between Korach and Moshe and Aharon. Please don't mention my name here. How do we see this? Rashi brings us to a verse, the end of the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse 6. When he's blessing slash rebuking Shimon and Levi, coupled the two of them, he says as follows, These are the words that Rashi uh, uh, brings to our attention. He says, you shall not join, my honor, you shall not join their assembly. What does that mean? My honor, you shall not join their assembly. Ah, Rashi shows us in our Torah portion this week. Look at this word. This word over here tells us al Aaron, that they, who are we talking about? Korach and all of his group. They gathered, they assembled against Moses and Aaron. You see this word over here? Bikalam, Bikalam means to gather. Vaikalu over here in, 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 in our Torah portion means to gather. In the great depth and divine presence and, and, and inspiration that Jacob had. When he was blessing Levi, he said, please, Hashem, do not allow my name be attached to Levi's descendant, which is his own descendant, in four generations from now, when his descendant is going to come up against Moshe and Aharon and start a rebellion. That's pretty deep. Make it very simple. Jacob prays to Hashem that his name will not be mentioned in the event or when Korach will get up and start his rebellion. He didn't want to be associated with it. So Reb Leib tells us that in truth, Rashi's question is based on the Talmud in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 109b. And over there, the Talmud expands on each and every one of these names. Yitzhar, Kehat, Levi, with each one with a negative, um, with a negative explanation of how Korach 
acted based on their names. Very interesting. We're not going to get into that. Then the Gemara asks something interesting. Why wasn't Jacob's name mentioned there? That's our question. That's Rashi's question. And we can expound it for the negative as well. That just like the word Yaakov, the root of the word Yaakov is Ekev, heal. The Talmud suggests we could also say in a negative tone that Korach was Ben She'akav et Atzmo Legehinom, a son, a child that stuck his heel into Gehinom, into hell, meaning in a bad way. So why is Jacob's name being left out, asks the Talmud, which was basically Rashi's question as well. And the Talmud answers because Jacob prayed that he would not be mentioned in regard to Korach. Very good. Reblade now, in a beautiful way, says, why is this even a question? Why would the Talmud assume that it would be for sure that we have to take Korach's lineage and draw it back all the way to Jacob? I mean, is four generations not enough? We got to go to, to the great-great-grandfather? What, what, why is the Talmud even saying that, that that's, a, that's a possibility, that that's the way it should be? So he answers based on something the Midrash reveals to us. Now, I have to be honest with you. What we're about to learn that Rebbe presents to us is something that I've learned every single year since I've been studying Parashat Korach. But I never put into perspective the way Rebbe does what he's about to do and separate between what it says in the scripture and what is the oral commentary. Now, some would say it doesn't really matter because we believe in everything. We believe in the written Torah and we believe in the oral Torah. And we know that we can't understand the written Torah without the oral trans transmission and the oral, oral explanation, 100%. But in this case, like in many others that we may have not even touched upon yet, but in this case, there's a specific, specific lesson and difference to know that what we're about to say now comes from the Midrash, comes from our sages as an oral transmission. So look what the Midrash reveals. The Midrash reveals that not only let's just rephrase it. The Midrash reveals to us what Korach's real issue was and what triggered him to start this rebellion against his cousin Moshe Rabbeinu. They say, the sages, the Midrash tells us, that it's because he was jealous. What was he jealous of? He was jealous of his little cousin. And I'm going to explain it to you exactly how. He was jealous of his little cousin who was elected as the leader of their family. His name was Elitzafan ben Uziel. He was chosen by Moshe Rabbeinu to be the leader of the family of Kehat. But Korach believed he should be the one who should have gotten that position. That he deserved it. He felt entitled. Wow, doesn't it sound like your children? He felt entitled. Because he said that based on seniority, based on age, he deserved it. Kehat had four children. Amram, Yitzhar, Hebron, and Uziel. So Korach looks at it this way. He says, Amram's two sons got the greatest positions. Korach was the leader, the king. Not Korach, sorry. Moshe Rabbeinu was the leader and the king. And Aaron was the priest. He was the Kohen. Who's next up in line? The next son's sons. After Amram comes Yitzhar. Yitzhar's son was Korach. Korach's like, that's it. I de deserve the next grand position that's being given out. But now Korach feels slighted. Not only was he not given it, skipped over his family, skipped over the next brother's family, Hebron, and went to the baby brother of Kehat, the fourth family, Uziel's son, Elitzafan. His baby cousin was given the position that he felt he rightfully deserved. And he was mad. Rebleib asks, and this is, this is, this is where this is where Rebbe Leib shares an amazing novelty with us. Where do our sages, where does the Midrash know that this is what go was going on in Korach's mind? The Torah doesn't say it. 
The Torah doesn't ever say that Korach was jealous. Doesn't ever say that Korach was jealous of his baby cousin's position, Eli Tzafan. None of this is written in the Torah. Rather, the Torah says, you know what Korach's claim was? Take a look at your screen. Korach's claim is as follows. Chapter 16, verse 3 in the book of Numbers, Bamidbar. They gather, they assemble around against Moshe and Aaron. You know what he says? Rav lachem, it's enough you've taken for yourself. Ki chol kulam kidoshim. Everyone's holy. Uftocham Hashem. And Hashem is amongst us all. Umadua tit nasi'u al kel Hashem. Why are you raising yourselves above everyone else, above the rest of the assembly? It's not fair. Korach's issue, black on white in the Torah, was why is the service in the temple, in the tabernacle, being taken away from all the firstborns and giving to, to Aaron and his children and his descendants? That's not fair. That's what the Torah says. Even Rashi explains on this. He was coming to, to, to question why is the priesthood being given to Aaron's family alone? The Ibn Ezra also writes that Korach, Datan, and Aviram were all firstborns, along with the 200 men that came together. They felt like they were being yanked away something that belonged to them. The right to serve in the tabernacle, in the temple. But you know what? The Midrash says, now that wasn't Korach's issue. You know what Korach's issue was? He was jealous. He had a personal vendetta. He felt like he was skipped over for the position of being the family leader. And that's why he started the rebellion. Rebellion says, how does the, how does the Midrash know that? The Torah says one thing, Midrash says something completely else. Why? We don't normally see something like this. Normally the Midrash comes to explain, comes to expound, but to tell me something so, so different Listen to what Leib says. It's fascinating. He says, firstly, we have to say that our sages, the authors of the Midrash, knew this as a matter of fact, based on transmission passed down from father to son, from rabbi to student, all the way back from back then. And that they knew what was going on in, in Krach's mind through divine inspiration, Ruach HaKodesh. That Korach indeed was jealous of Eli Tzafan. Furthermore, Ablaib says that if, we have to say, that if Korach would have been given this position as the head of the family, he would have not been jealous, and he would have not started this rebellion against Aaron and Moshe. And his claims of priesthood that were taken away from him would have never even been an issue, a non-issue in the Torah. That's fascinating, first of all. But now Rebbe takes another, another, peels off another layer of this onion. He says, but still, even though there's no hint from this in the Torah, that really Korach had another issue, but he was saying that he had a certain issue. He was saying that his issue was the, that the priesthood was taken away, but no, he had a real personal vendetta and jealousy versus his younger cousin. Even though there's no hint of the Torah in this, is there any way we could hint to the fact that Korach was trying to attempt to hide his true reason and mask his rebellion with another reason? Let's repeat that. It's clear that in the Torah there's no hint to the fact that Korach was really angry. His rebellion was fueled because he was jealous. But the Torah is saying, no, it's not because he was jealous of his younger cousin's position. Rather, he's coming and saying that it's because the priesthood was stripped away from him and the rest of his followers. There's no hint to that. But now Reb Leib wonders, is there possibly a hint that Korach is showing us that reason A is why he's starting the rebellion, but really reason B, deep down inside, is why he's waging this rebellion against, against Moshe Rabbeinu. And he's masking it with another reason. I'm coming and claiming that I'm angry because the priesthood stripped away. But is that a mask to another reason? To the reason that he's really jealous? 
And Reb Leib says, indeed, this is the fact. And he's going to show to us where this is hinted from. You see, our sages knew that Korach had this hidden reason, had this hidden agenda for his rebellion. Mind you, his agenda went way further than he ever imagined. Not only did he become jealous of Elitzafan, the younger cousin, then he was jealous and he was claiming Aaron's position. And then it got to the point that he started claiming Moses' position with the showdown. They had a showdown with the with who's gonna which which of the two's offering is going to be accepted by Hashem. Korach or Moshe Rabbeinu's. So he was even fighting and waging against Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, the Torah tells us what Korach's claim is. And this is why, Leib says, this is why the Torah specifically delineated Korach's lineage deliberately back all the way to Levi. Normally you say it's so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And maybe you'll say the grandfather, but to go all the way back to the great-grandfather, that's a little bit weird. You know why, Reblave says? To hint to us that Korach's actions are connected to the actions of his, grand, of his great-grandfather, Levi. What is the first time, our first encounter with Levi in our Torah? When is that? You know when it was? It, when he was planning with his brother, Shimon. They were devising a way to revenge the disgrace that was caused to their younger sister, Dina, when Shem raped her. The Torah says that they answered Shem in a deceitful way. I'm going to share with you. Genesis chapter 34, verse 13. In a cunning, in a deceitful way. Why? What was going on? Shimon and Levi planned to kill the entire city. But that's not what he told them. He says, if you want to join with us, if you want to marry our daughters and our daughters are going to marry you, you have to be circumcised. Oh, you think that they were going to circumcise all the men and then, oh, three days later, they woke up and said, oh yeah, now's a good time to kill them on there all week. No, they planned it all along. They were saying one thing. They were thinking something else. This was Levi. Now, I believe is very strict. He says, not only did they deceit or were they deceitful and cunning towards Shem, their father, his father, Hamor, right? Interesting name for, for a king, right? Donkey King. I think that's one of the Mario Kart uh, characters, by the way. But anyways, this donkey and Shechem, not only did, he just, did they deceit him and them and their entire city, they deceited their very own father, Jacob. How so? When they came to tell Yaakov Avinu what happened, they said, we just want to weaken the inhabitants of Shechem so that they can have the power to go and rescue their sister, Dina. But that's not what they had planned all along. All along, they had in mind to circumcise all the men. And on the third day, biotam koavim, as the Torah says, when they were in severe pain, to go and slaughter all of them. They were cunning. They were deceitful in what they did. Mind you, they were just over bar mitzvah. They were 13 years old. But nevertheless, we're talking about our our tribes. The Torah this week, Reb Leib says, is drawing back Korach's lineage all the way to Levi to teach us that just as Levi hid his real plan from Shem and from his father, Korach also was hiding his real plan and his real reason, his motivation for his rebellion against Moshe and Aaron and Elitzafan. He showed it one way, but in his heart he had something else. Levi said one thing, but he had something else in mind. Now, Reb Leib says, this is deep, but I think you guys got it. 
Now Reblaib says, now it makes sense why the Gemara was asking, why don't you include Jacob? Why not? Let's draw Korach all the way back to Jacob. Not just because, because Jacob was also deceitful. He was also cunning in the way that he took his brother's blessing. Let's go back. The Torah itself even says it. I'm not saying anything new. Genesis chapter 27, verse 35. Isaac says to Esav, your brother came cunningly and took your blessing. He tricked me. He deceived me. So that's why Reblaib says the Gemara is asking, why don't we also connect him back to Jacob? If we're taking Korach back all the way back to his great-grandfather because of reasons of deceit, so go back to Yaakov for that reason. Go back to Leah also, right? Leah was deceitful when she disguised herself as Rachel. Why are you stopping at Levi? Meaning, on one hand, it's so far-fetched to go all the way back to Levi to the great-grandfather. But if you're going back to the great-grandfather, now it makes sense why the Talmud says, go back to the great-great-grandfather. Because Korach's fault is in his cunning, untruthful display of motivation and reason. We see that by Levi. We see that by Yaakov and Leah. Now, Reb Leib says, you have to see how important it is and how very careful a person has to be to be 100% emet, 100% truthful. You see, because Yaakov deviated a millimeter off of truth. A millimeter, I call it. Not an inch and not a mile. A millimeter. He deceded. He, 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 he devised. He veered off of being 100% truthful to steal, quote unquote, the blessings of Esav. Leah learned from him. Leah, his future wife. Disguise yourself as Rachel. That's not 100% honest. She had reason for it, but it wasn't. Shimon and Levi were also cunning to Shem and to their own father. And this trickled down, this trait trickled down all the way down to Korach, who tricked his entire following to believe that he's fighting the battle on behalf of all of them. On, for, for the sake of the firstborns who had their keona yanked away from them. Not fair. But really deep down, he had a personal vendetta. He had an issue with Eli Tzafan and with Moshe and Aaron. Sounds like a politician to me. What do you think? Right? They, they, they claim, they claim, they claim, they say, they say, they say. They're all righteous. It was all politicians. It was across the board. But something else is in their heart. There's another motivation. And we'll never know it. The Gemara answers, Rebbe says, the Gemara says, Yaakov prayed not to be mentioned with Korach. As if to say, if he would have not have prayed for it, he would have been mentioned indeed. Because he follows in suit. He's the source of the problem. Quote, unquote. He would have been mentioned in the Torah. This week's first Torah portion would have read as Vaikach Korach ben Yitzhar ben Kehat ben Levi ben Yaakov Avinu. And the only reason why it doesn't read that way is because Jacob prayed for it. He prayed that even though there's some type of commonality in their deeds, and that is deceit, please don't have his name mentioned with Korach, the wicked Korach. So if Yaakov was wrong, Rebleib asks, so why was his prayer answered? Why is he not mentioned in the beginning? You know what he says? Because at the end of the day, Rebleib says, at the end of the day, Yaakov acted based on his mother's commands. His mother commanded him to go and disguise himself as such. His mother knew through prophecy, that that blessing could not go to Esav. Why? When Esav was, we've spoken about this, we're not going to get into it, but when Esav was born, he was befitting to be the fourth 
of the fourth patriarch. They're supposed to be Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov and Esav. Esav forfeited that position based on his deeds. Yaakov had to take both. He had to be a double Av, a double father. And he needed those blessings that Esav was supposed to have because he was going to use it for the good. So even though it had a sense of cunningness and deceit, he did it based on his mother's command through prophecy. And he did it for a good, 100% good cause, not personal, 100% not personal. Korach, on the other hand, he was driven solely by greed, jealousy, and anger. And that's the difference. So the lesson that we can learn, two lessons we can learn from this fascinating insight is number one's parents have to be so careful. All of us have to be so, so careful on how we act, what we do, what we say, because our children have these huge antennas and very, very, very large focus lenses. They see everything. They see the truth. Believe it or not, they see our motivations because when we come home and we let loose, the truth comes up. The truth is apparent. And those very subtle rotten deeds and traits that we have unfortunately get passed down to our children, grandchildren, and continue. Those nuances, if we have any nuance of deceit, of anger, of jealousy, that gets transmitted onto our children and grandchildren. And we have to be very, very careful. Even Jacob, the greatest of our patriarchs, had a millimeter deviation from 100% truth. And look, five generations later, how it trickles down to a complete rebellion against the greatest prophet that ever walked the face of this earth, Moshe Rabbeinu. Second lesson we can learn from this is that as parents, we have the power and the obligation to pray for our children's success. We see this in Jacob's prayer time and time again. We see the power of Jacob's prayer even this week by the fact that he did not want his name, which is not enough for a personal reason, his name for what it means to be Bnei Yaakov, to be Bnei Israel, not to be mentioned with the wicked Korach. So number one, our deeds, our actions, the way we speak have to be so calculated in front of our children. And it's hard. And that's why we come to these classes, because we're not perfect. But when we speak about this, when we learn about this, it draws our attention and we come and we catch ourselves in the heat of the moment. Pause, think, or even after the fact, pause, think, how will I do better next time? And number two, the power of prayer that a parent has for their children. A child's success is primarily due, our sages tell us, to the prayers of their parents, of that child, and to the infusion of confidence and self-worth that the parents give to that child. So it's a great responsibility to be a parent. And it doesn't stop there. It continues when you become a grandparent and a great-grandparent. The responsibility of praying for our children and our descendants and infusing them with a great sense of being a role model is what we are here for. May Hashem bless us in the merit of Rebleib that we will all better our ways, better our deeds, better our speech, at least for the sake of our children and our descendants. And it'll answer our prayers for them, for the continuation and their success until Bizrat Hashem, the very soon coming of Mashiach, we mirabe amenu amen.